not the best situation when uh, difficult stuff to understand uh, has to be understood in such heat. And um, unfortunately, this, much of the material in this talk won't be easy. So uh, you will have to concentrate, unfortunately. But uh, you know, if you want to know how psychedelics work in the brain, unfortunately, it's not easy, and uh, and uh, it does require a little bit of um, attention. So first of all. Um, here are some molecular structures. You can see psilocin in there, which is the metabolite of psilocybin. That's really what's doing magic in, in our research. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, in general, when people take uh, psilocybin, they take magic mushrooms. And you can, what's striking when you look at these molecular structures is how similar they are to the endogenous neurotransmitter serotonin at the bottom right-hand corner there. So it's, it's always intriguing for me, uh, no matter how many times I say it, that. Um, it's quite remarkable that such a small change in the molecular structure of these compounds confer such profound effects on consciousness. And it's just a realization of something like that that, if you're, you know, interested in science, is something which is of great interest for you. And you want to understand what the hell is going on to, to, uh, to do this stuff. So, a major finding in the history of scientific research with psychedelics jumping forward a little bit to the 1980s and uh, in terms of the pharmacology of psychedelics, it was found that there's a strong positive correlation between a psychedelic drug's affinity or stickiness for a certain serotonin receptor and its potency. So the more sticky a psychedelic, the more potent it is. And it's easy to illustrate that with an example. So LSD is especially sticky at the serotonin 2A receptor and it's especially potent. Only require very small amounts of it for it to be psychoactive. So a discovery like that you know, really puts us on some firm ground and goes you know, a very small way but, but begins really the trail of kind of demystifying these what people often experience as incredibly mystical experiences. Where is the serotonin receptor that uh, is related to the action, particularly related to the action of psychedelics, this serotonin 2A receptor? Well, what's striking is how cortically distributed it is. So you don't see much in the subcortical region, the bits in the kind of right in the core. Uh, it's more this kind of outer bark of the brain uh, that you see the serotonin 2A receptor. And particularly in uh, cortical regions that have undergone um, particularly large evolutionary expansion. Uh, they're high level cortical regions. And one region, particularly, is this posterior cingulate cortex region, the PCC. And you'll hear about that more and more. So the serotonin 2A receptors are especially heavily distributed in this uh, particular region of the cortex. So to move on very swiftly, what I'm going to try and do is, is give sort of aspects of the uh, subjective experience of psychedelics and then present some hypothesis about what's going on in the brain to account for these experiences. Um, so here's a, a key, a, a core characteristic um, aspect of the psychedelic experience, that, that uh, um, experience of consciousness being fragmented, of, of losing its constraints, and kind of entering a kind of hyper-associative state. So this is a report from one of our volunteers, he said everything became fragmented, uh, things were all in bits and it was very hard to hold it all together in the coherent stream. So this is a report after we administered intravenous psilocybin to a volunteer. Uh, here again, this volunteer said there was a definite sense of lubrication and freedom of the cogs being loosened and firing off in all sorts of unexpected directions. So these kind of, it's interesting when people report and describe their experiences with psychedelics because they kind of intuit what's going on in the brain on a mechanistic level. And actually, when we carried out our functional brain imaging work, uh, we found something which really fitted quite neatly, really resonated with what people were describing. So that's quite satisfying. Although at first, the result itself was actually surprising. It does make a lot of sense to us now. So our first study had 15 healthy volunteers. They had a mean age of 34. 18 minute scan, uh, placebo and psilocybin. We had a pre-infusion period. We injected the drug over 60 seconds. People came up very rapidly. Um, they described it as a kind of push, you know, it's a really sudden shift from normal waking consciousness into this um, often profoundly altered state of consciousness. Two milligrams psilocybin compared to about 15 milligrams of orally administered psilocybin, which is a kind of moderate dose. So Robert Griffiths in the States is giving double this actually. So uh, this may explain why we don't see um, so often, or we actually see quite rarely, uh, reports of mystical experiences in our research. 
also may have something to do with the volunteers themselves as well, and the setting, of course. Um, <clears throat> so we have a pre-infusion period, the drugs injected, and then essentially we look at changes in brain blood flow after we've injected the drug, and this is what we found. So uh, we found only decreases in brain blood flow, even reducing the statistical threshold to an unacceptable level. We still didn't see any increases in, in, in blood flow in any regions. So this was um, uh, inconsistent with some previous PET work, uh, and I'll be frank, I don't really understand uh, you know, uh, why that discrepancy exists. Uh, we've replicated our result with uh, a number of different modalities now. It may be something to do with the um, dynamics of, of the PET imaging, I'm not sure. So anyway, uh, here are the results of our research. We found decreases in blood flow. And it wasn't entirely global, they were quite localised. And they were localised again to these higher level regions of the cortex. So regions that have undergone large evolutionary expansion in the cortex at least. So the posterior cingulate cortex, medial prefrontal cortex, these lateral parietal regions, and the thalamus um, and, and uh, the basal ganglia. So all these structures are important hub structures in the, in the brain. And the function of a hub is to integrate and to confer some kind of constraint on the function. So if you have a system which is chaotic, then you would want to, well, the system could organise such that it, it organises so that its activity is, is more synchronous, and that will be the function of these uh, hubs. So, uh, one implication of this is that psilocybin compromises the function of the brain's integration hubs. So this image here shows where uh, white matter connections in the brain are especially dense. So those are the cables that go between neurons which do the, the computation in the brain. So they're especially dense in the regions that you saw the decreases in blood flow. Just to provide a metaphor for what a hub is, it's a place where uh, lots of uh, things from, from different parts of the system can come together into this common centre. So you can think of it as a major train station in London, or you can think of it as a capital city in a country. Um, and one, uh, another implication is that these, these core uh, hubs in the brain serve as a kind of uh, controller in the brain. Did somebody see the fat controller? <laughs> um, so uh, we did another study involving um, uh, the classic signal of, of uh, fMRI, the bold signal. Again, 15 healthy volunteers, similar age, 12 minute scan, same dose of psilocybin. We looked at changes post infusion compared to our pre infusion baseline and also versus placebo. What did we find? Well, with this analysis, we were most interested, or I was most interested in, in this measure of functional connectivity, which is correlated, temporally correlated brain activity. So you can make a spatial map of where in the brain is activity correlated to your seed region, which is this bit in red there. And the rest of the map there, you can see this network of regions that have correlated activity with the red. So, and then we look at how psilocybin changes that. And this is what we found. So this is baseline. These are regions in orange that are coupled or correlated uh, with the uh, seed region, the red region. And after psilocybin, the level of correlation within the network decreases. Uh, and it was a significant de decrease in these, in here in these two different networks that we looked at. So this may relate to this kind of disintegration of certain brain networks. And importantly, as I'll, I'll go on and, and describe, these networks are especially related to high-level cognitive functions, such as uh, one sense of self, self-reflection, Perspection, thinking about the future, autobiographical recollection, going looking far back into our past, and very high level, arguably human specific functions um, are related to these brain networks. Particularly one of them. So here is looking at functional connectivity with a hippocampal seed. You can see a baseline here, what's correlated with it. And this was a really interesting result uh, in that the decreases in uh, in functional connectivity or cup in the correlated activity with the seed region, with the hippocampus, were constrained to regions of this default mode network. And I'll talk about this network more and more because it seems especially important in um, 
on very interesting things in general in terms of psychology, but also very important in terms of how psychedelics work in the brain. Just to provide a little bit of context of what connectivity within this particular network, this default mode network, relates to, well, when connectivity is especially high between the posterior cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex, the kind of core of this default mode network, then you have high scores of rumination in patients with depression. So this kind of concerted introspection that you see in depression where people are locked and stuck in their own heads, that correlates with the kind of hyper-constraint hyper within this default mode network. And you can see on the side of Simon that we saw a decrease in that. So that was again one of these clues that uh, allowed us to um, start hypothesizing, of course, based on all the stuff in the 60s and, and anecdotes as well, that psilocybin may be useful as a treatment for depression. Uh, here, uh, just crossing over to other research I've done, it's actually the only result I show on MDMA just because there's a lot to get through and it's hard to describe how classics work, let alone MDMA. Uh, so, this is a correlation between uh, hippocampal and uh, hippocampal functional connectivity and, and decreases under MDMA. And there was a, a, a significant positive correlation between the magnitude of the decrease in coupling between the hippocampus and the medial prefrontal region and ratings of positive mood. So, it kind of um, complements the uh, result I showed here, where you know, connectivity up, depression, connectivity uh, uh, down, positive mood, euphoria with MDMA. So this, um, this relationship may be related to a number of things, and it may be related to uh, mood as well. In that when you're stuck in your head, then you're often not so happy. Um, so what explains the so-called ego disintegration experience in the psychedelic state? Well, it seems like a, quite a challenging thing to address, but it actually there's a lot of evidence that really talks to this. And, uh, um, I think we can start you know, um, making inferences about this kind of stuff on relatively solid ground. So this is what one of our volunteers said after psilocybin, a um, familiar face to some of you actually, <laughs> he said that was real ego dead stuff, only existed as a concept, as an idea. So, so this volunteer was profoundly affected by his experience with uh, intravenous psilocybin. So what is this self in the brain? So the wrong question is to ask where is the self in the brain? We're often kind of stuck on this way of looking at the brain in this, in this sort of spatial manner. And that's misleading. You shouldn't fall into that trap because the brain, of course, is incredibly dy dynamic. It's only that when we try and understand things, we often look at static pictures. So we think in the spatial domain. But that can be misleading. So we should think really what in terms of temporal activity as well. well um, Self-reflection uh, does elevate activity in the default mode network, that's found with fMRI, and it also increases this thing called alpha power, so a certain oscillatory frequency in the brain. When that's elevated, so is self-reflection, or during conditions of self-reflection, that's elevated. And I'll go on to describe whether it's relevant. The suspension of introspective thought suppresses DMM activity. This is all stuff supporting that the DMM particularly is related to the sense of self. Meditation is something which promotes this kind of non-self state, will deactivate the DMN that's been found at quite a point here, but there's actually a site on here, but there's actually a number of studies which uh, show that. So just side side, I'm showing you that. The thought mode network develops through ontogeny, so developmentally it actually undergoes a uh, maturation in terms of the nature of its connectivity as the self matures as we uh, go um, from infancy to adulthood. Uh, the thought mode network region expanded in humans, I've talked about that. Posterior cingulate cortex is a particular um, hub region that I've uh, pointed out. Uh, there's evidence that it serves as a kind of central controller of brain activity. Uh, that activity in other brain networks is actually modulated by activity in the default mode network. So all these things are kind of telling us that this is actually a really important network in the brain for global brain function. So it makes sense in that, in that way that a drug which profoundly affects, <coughs> affects consciousness should be affecting this system. Uh, one thing which will help us understand what self is if you were to have lesions in the default mode network, that often gives us clues about function. But the thing is, you rarely get that in the default mode network, probably because it's very important, it's very kind of cushioned in the brain, it's not um, vulnerable to either injury or uh, stroke. Um, so it's rare that you find that. There is something called balance syndrome which affects kind of part of it, and in that syndrome, people uh, struggle to integrate. Um, percep perceptions usually into coherent wholes or gestalts. So there's a kind of 
disintegration in that, in that disorder. So what is the self in the brain? Well, the proposal is it's this default by network thing, and we found decreased blood flow and decreased connectivity in it, and we've also recently carried out a med study, again, in 15 healthy volunteers, a uh, similar protocol with a pre-infusion period and a post-infusion period. And again, um, I'll show you in a minute, we've seen results in the default by network. But first of all, here are some subjective experiences from people's uh, encounters with psilocybin in the scanner. And I just want to highlight one because it would be related to a correlation that we'll see in a minute. And it's uh, this one, I experienced a disintegration of myself or ego. So first of all, I'll show you the basic results we've been made. Uh, we found only decreases again. And these were localized to high level association regions. So you can see a coherent story coming out here. It was particularly marked in this alpha frequency band and particularly marked in the posterior cerebral cortex where we've seen decreases in blood flow with, uh, um, with uh, arterial stimulation fMRI where we see decreases in connectivity with the amoeba prefrontal analysis also other analyses. So there's a consistent picture coming up here where this posterior cerebral cortex region particularly is implicated in the mechanism of action of at least psilocybin. There's a drop just showing pictorially the drop in the alpha frequency that you get with psilocybin. You should get a nice peak there. It's sort of indicative of this kind of organization, this oscillatory and rhythmic organization that the brain normally has. And that organization essentially collapses, you could say, onto psilocybin. So, the reason why I'm banging on about uh, the self and all that kind of stuff earlier in the default mode network is that we found this really quite striking correlation between people's ratings of this item, I experienced a disintegration of myself or ego, and the decreases in alpha power in the posterior cingular cortex. So, you know, it's findings like this that really start to lend, uh, for me, you know, uh, they're, they're really quite exciting because now we're starting to crack, you know, um, or at least starting to chip away at uh, these, these very difficult but important questions like what is the self, and providing evidence that the self arises from the brain, and that uh, you know psychedelic drugs, which uh, cause this uh, ego disintegration, will affect those systems from which the self is meant to arise, according to the evidence. Uh, so, another question. Here we go. What is, what is the self in the brain? Well, here's the hypothesis: the self is an emergent property of self-organized activity in the default mode network. Ego disintegration is the effect of a collapse in the self-organized activity in the default mode network. What, what explains disturbed ego boundaries in the psychedelic state? This is another very important aspect of the phenomenology of psychedelics and something that is talked about so widely, especially in the psychedelic community. Disturbed ego boundaries are often described in a mystical or spiritual way. So here this volunteer, this is from one of Roland's uh, studies, and he said, uh, this volunteer said, the feeling of no boundaries, I didn't know where I ended ego ended and his surroundings began, the outside world began. Somehow I was able to comprehend what oneness is. Uh, so, what could this arise from? Well, here's an image showing, uh, it's a functional connectivity image. You can see that activity in this particular network is correlated here, and you can see another network which has anti-correlated activity or anti-phase activity. So, as activity in the orange and yellow goes up, activity in this other network goes down, that's the blue network here. This blue network is engaged when we focus our attention on the external world. Like if you're trying really hard to concentrate now, it would be activating this network. But if you lost interest and it's too hot, then you enter this default mode state. And uh, good luck because it's supposed to be natural. And uh, that, um, that uh, network becomes engaged. So there's this kind of interesting yin yang between networks which seem to support, uh, support uh, sort of naturally um, imposing on the competitive functions, cognitive functions, introspection or externally focused attention. Subject self internal, internal that's the default network, other object external, that's the uh, attention network. So what do we find with psilocybin? Well, we find that this usual anti-correlation that you see, this natural anti-correlation, which is functionally important, you need to have that, that breaks down under psilocybin. Uh, and it was really quite a marked change, so a very highly significant result here. And here, looking at two different networks which were involved in externally focused attention, profoundly affected by psilocybin, and decreased, so decreased anti-correlation 
and you can see it here. So here, you, and he's got some more orthogonality. You can see these networks' activity is unrelated. Then under the drug, they become correlated. They become as one. Uh, and where else do you see this decreased default mode network anticorrelation? You see it in schizophrenia, especially in early psychosis. Deep meditation, especially a form that promotes uh, non-self, non-dual awareness. And the hypothesis here: the decreased anticorrelation between a network serving self-reflection, the default mode network, and another that serves externally focused attention may explain the so-called unitive experience observed in the psychedelic state, in the meditative state, and sometimes in psychotic states like early psychosis. Now, interestingly, Walter Stace, who's done this very nice work looking at the uh, characteristics of mystical experiences across religions, <laughs> identified this unitive experience as being the core characteristic of the spiritual experience. So, the hypothesis is that this is related to this loss of orthogonality between the brain networks. What it, this is the last one, and it's the hardest one, and I've got about eight minutes maybe to, to talk about it. So what explains the feeling of uncertainty in the psychedelic state, that eerie strangeness that we get? Well, here I'm appealing to a degree of abstraction, although we do have concrete results which uh, support it, and actually we're accumulating more and more. So here we're talking about entropy, which is a measure of, sometimes described in kind of qualitative terms as a measure of disorder, you could also think of it more concretely as an index of uncertainty, how difficult it is to predict the state of a system. Here, with the constraint in the system, it's easier to predict, say, the spatial location of these gas molecules. If you remove the constraint, you have an expansion of the gas, and it's harder to predict the spatial location of any gas molecule. If you were to plot this, you would uh, have, with the constraint, um, probability distribution such that it's easier to predict the state of the system, and uh, if you were to remove this constraint and the gas expands, it's harder. Here's a concrete result looking at a um, default mode network parameter and functional connectivity within the default mode network and variance in the connectivity within the default mode network. And we found that under psilocybin, there was a much uh, uh, there was a, a significantly uh, increased uh, um, sort of distribution of activity in the default mode network, it became much less easier to predict its activity. Um, so it fits this rule of, this general rule of an increase in disorder in the state and it being harder to predict the behaviour of a particular network, that the system moves away from an ordered state towards a disordered one. So if functionally important network parameters lose their definition, their normal definition under psilocybin, they become less well defined. And we think this may explain quite, probably quite a lot of the phenomenology of the psychedelic state and potentially other altered states of consciousness as well. Now this is really difficult stuff and I don't want to go over it. But um, the hypothesis that I'm presenting you could describe as, as this entropic brain hypothesis. And it appeals to a popular uh, subject in science at the moment called self-organized criticality. And this is the idea that Systems, often natural systems, exhibit uh, certain characteristics such that uh, it seems as though the system, the natural system, is poised in a position between uh, complete uh, disorder or um, complete order. So they find this kind of equilibrium from equilibrium where they reside, the system resides for a while, where it exhibits certain characteristics and it's described as a critical system because there's a critical point at which the system has to be in order to exhibit these characteristics of, uh, of, um, of high level organisation. So the system needs to be perfectly poised between either being too ordered or too disordered and here I'm showing some uh, swallows, um, star leaves uh, doing their thing and you can see the kind of emergent sort of properties when you look at the whole system that you wouldn't get um, in a chaotic system or a too organised or that all say sat on the ground. Pearl Back writes about this in How Nature Works, if you're interested in that. And uh, so the idea here is that normal waking consciousness may be somewhere near this critical position. There's a lot of uh, research now showing that brain activity uh, exhibits this uh, uh, criticality. And um, this may be optimal for cognition. If the brain can be poised close to a critical state, then we can have flexible cognition but not, um, not too chaotic cognition, uh, and we can have organised 
tradition, but not too organised such that there's no flexibility in our thinking or in the system. So the hypothesis really is that psychedelic states and maybe other states such as infancy, REM sleep dreaming, early psychosis, and maybe an individual's showing traits, um, divergent thinking, high schizotypy, and maybe um, creative thinking, uh, would be further over to, to the pole of a supercritical state uh, or a high entropy state or a higher disordered state. Uh, on the other extreme, you would have coma, deep sleep, seizure, where activity is highly correlated in the brain and there's no information processing. And maybe depression also, maybe the, the, the brain system becomes excessively organized such that it becomes too rigid. There's no flexibility in the way the system is working and, um, and that uh, translates into the start of cognition as well. Obsessive compulsive disorder, which is all about compulsive thinking, so excessively organized motoric stereotype thinking, which is indicative of a system that's become too organized, it's entered a kind of attractive state. Uh, addiction as well, so that's the kind of OCD like state. Now, interestingly, recently, um, this is the thought that it's useful to go away with if you get it, um, is that um, actually the research on brain activity is indicating that the brain isn't perfectly poised in this critical position it's actually slightly subcritical. So it's slightly towards the power of being more organized than other systems in nature which show criticality. And that's interesting because it raises the possibility that if the psychedelic state is further towards the uh, supercritical end of things or the, the high entropy end of things, then it may actually be a more critical state than, uh, than normal waking consciousness. That's a proposal which I think it's worth considering because there's certain characteristics of the critical system which actually resonate with the phenomenal, phenomenology of the psychedelic state. For instance, that if you perturb a system showing criticality, then it should have the maximum effect on that system. So the kick that you would give the system should reverberate through the system. And that may explain, for instance, let's think of an environmental perturbation like a shock that you would get. In normal waking consciousness, it's quite easy to do away with that transient event and just be like, well, that was just a shock. But in the psychedelic state, you shock someone, it could profoundly affect them and maybe put them on the trajectory of a bad trip. So that kind of fits the phenomenology. There's characteristics of critical systems that are maximally sensitive to perturbation, they show this avalanche behavior, and they also show fractal organization. I'm sure that means something to you on a spatial level. Uh, in terms of geometric hallucinations themselves, but there's um, other dimensions of, of um, practical organisation. And then just to thank uh, David Nutz, particularly Amanda Fielding of the Beckley Foundation, who supported a lot of this. Ben Sessa, who's done a lot of uh, our dosings and helped us a lot with medical cover, um, and just generally uh, thinking about all this stuff, and other doctors and other researchers. Mark Bolstridge and Mendel, uh, Kaylin, and lots of very nice people who've helped me a lot. So, thank you very much for your attention.